What is it about a trip to Central America that may be the one factor that will make this trip a trip of a lifetime? Is it the chance to catch a tarpon or a permit on a fly? Is it getting a break from the U.S. winters for a warm tropical location? Or is it the local food and people that make this trip magical? My guest today is going to take us into a recently launched Honduran fly fishing lodge. And today you will find out how this operation is unique and how you can do it yourself this year. This is the Wet Fly Swing Podcast, where I show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare for that big trip, and what you can do to give back to the fish species you love. Hey, how's it going? I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a little kid. I grew up around a little fly shop and have created one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in this country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers than just about anyone in the world. Cam Gordon, Fishhound Expeditions Guide and Honduras Fly Lodge owner, is going to share the unique experience that is Honduras. We find out what Cam thinks is the best time for fishing at this location. We're going to find out what the island of Utila is like and how this is so much different than a lot of the places you're going to head out to. Uh, we dig into this amazing little island, how it all happens, how to get there, and the fishing. Uh, we're going to find out what it was like building this thing from the ground up to one of the most famous flats fishing areas in the world. Plus, you're going to find out how to think like a fly and to get more fish to take your offering this year. Time to travel to another spectacular fishing destination, this time with friend of the podcast, Cam Gordon from BayIslandExpedition.com. How you doing, Cam? Hey, Dave. Good morning. I'm great. How are you, man? Good, good, good. We're going to follow up on an episode we had, episode 447. We'll have a link in the show notes where we talked about Basically, this lodge that you have going, and I think back then it was a little bit earlier in the in the process. Right now, you've kind of launched this thing out there, and people can actually check in on it and, and reserve a spot. So we're going to talk about Honduras. We're going to talk about you know all the species down there that are, that are amazing, how you're different from maybe some of the other lodges up north of you, things like that. But um, yeah, let's start with the update. What's been going on the last year since we talked? I think it was almost a year ago to the day that we talked. What's been? How's this last year been for you? Oh man, it has been wild. Yeah, it has been a year. It's been a wild year. Yeah, starting a um, you know fly fishing resort down in Honduras turns out it's no easy task. But uh, <laughs> we just um, had our soft opening, as I was calling it, because um. So you know, obviously, as you know, I guide full time in Alaska for the summer, and so um, I have a lot of repeat clients now at this point, and so I took uh, two couples. Uh, that are, are clients of mine have been fishing with me for a few years down and, and I, you know, if you come out in the back country with me for seven days, I'm obviously going to talk about Honduras. I'm probably going to talk your ear off about it because right. it's the coolest place ever to fish. So I had some clients that I, I extended out, you know, an invitation and I was like, hey, so uh, we're going to do what we call what I'm calling the soft opening here. So this is the first time we're ever taking paying clients down to Honduras to go fishing. So you know, could be amazing and it could be a little rough around the edges. Do you want to come? And uh, yeah, I had two um, uh, groups say, heck yeah, we want to do that. And uh, and they were a smashing success, man. It was awesome. It went so well. This is great. I love this. I think that it's smart the way you're doing it, you know, where you can flesh out some, any of the issues they have with, you know, with the soft opening. So and I want to get into that fully on this trip, but maybe let's start back to Honduras. Let's take it a step back and think Honduras, you know, you've got Belize up there, you know, north of you or whatever. You've got all these famous places and Honduras is definitely one that's out there, but maybe you don't hear about as many as much about it. Maybe describe Honduras for somebody that doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. So um, we are actually, we're in the country of Honduras, but we're in the Bay Islands. Uh, so the island that we're on is called Utila. It's a tiny little island off the coast of Honduras. Uh, the Bay Islands, a lot of people are familiar with the major island, which is Roatan. Um, and then next to Roatan is Guanaja. And then, so we're the third Bay Island, um, of Utila. Um, it's a small island. It's incredibly friendly, so safe. There's no cars on the island. Uh, so everybody gets around on like golf carts and tuk-tuks and mopeds and bicycles. Yeah, it's adorable. It's very nice, friendly place. Yeah, so it, a lot of people think like Honduras, like, you know, that could come with uh, a little um, concern. Whereas, you know, Utila, the island that we're on, a lot of Utilians don't really 
say that they're like Honduran. They're from Utila. Utila is, you know, they're Utila. Oh, right. Yeah, it's a really nice little different place. It's definitely not mainland Honduras. Yeah, how big is the island? I'm glad you said size. How big is that? Just give us a rough idea of that size of that island. Okay, so the island is 16 square miles, and about over two thirds of that is like uninhabited. It's mostly just like mangroves. So about a third of that 16 miles is, um, you know, you got houses, some grocery stores, a lot of really nice restaurants. You've got a couple beaches and obviously some great flats to fish. Um, the island is mostly visited by backpackers. It's a very popular place to go scuba diving. This is great. Wow. So this is cool. So so I'm already, you're already setting the stage for this and how this is a little bit different, but you've got this small island which has things going on it. I mean, and you know, we're going to talk more about your lodge and things like that, but maybe let's start there. If somebody's coming in, let's just take it back another step and do they, how does that work? If somebody's coming in, let's say they're coming in from the West Coast, is it an easy place to get down to your, you know, your operation? Yeah, both um, groups of clients, one of their things that they both said was, I can't believe how easy it is to get here. So their direct flights that go from Dallas and Miami into Roatan every single day. Um, so for most folks getting, even for me from Alaska, getting to Dallas is pretty easy. So yeah, depending on where you're coming from, they also do direct flights, funny enough, from Minneapolis. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can really hit it from wherever you're at, you know, uh, you can get there pretty easily. And then once you arrive into Roatan, you go through customs, which does not really take long at all. And then we have a driver, he's got your name, you know, written down, and he takes you to a private airfield where you hop in a Cessna and the Cessna takes you over the Caribbean because you land on Roatan, which has, you know, international airport. And then we charter a flight for you to get you to Utila. So from the time you land in Roatan to the time we're having a cocktail at the resort is like two hours. Yeah. Two hours. Wow. Yeah. So it's right there. You got, I mean, basically you've got Honduras, you know, the mainland is down below you, but you've got this island you fly. So you literally don't ever really go to the mainland during this trip. No, sir. You stay in the Bay Islands. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. And then when they get there, they get, well, maybe just describe the operation of somebody that sounds like this is kind of a normal, typical week long trip. What does that look like? They fly in. What does the first day, night look like there? Yeah. So you're going to, you know, you'll hop in the Cessna, which is, you know, a beautiful plane ride over the Caribbean. You'll land in Utila. We'll greet you at the, um, the airstrip there and we'll give you a ride to the resort. The resort where you're going to be staying is this massive house in the hills with like a swimming pool and beautiful kitchen, living room, huge bedroom, like private bathroom. It's it's this lovely little quiet spot and it's it's just awesome. And uh, so we hang out there for a little while, um, you know, let you guys freshen up, shower. And then by that time, most flights arrive into Roatan about two o'clock. So you'll be getting to Utila around four or five o'clock. So then we'll have, you know, some nice welcome dinner reservations at a local restaurant where we'll go grab some drinks and dinner and then rest up because the following day you start your six days of guided flats fishing. There it is. So, so that's it. So basically chill out the for, and is, typically is this coming in on like a Saturday or Sunday or how does that look? You can come in any day of the week that works for you. Okay. And then what about uh, how many, you know, people can you handle on this at the lodge here? Yeah, that's a great question. So we can handle a fair amount of folks at the lodge. You know, we could probably do two to six people. But as of right now, we're keeping it pretty small. We're just doing two to four person trips just due to, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot here, getting this thing up and going. And the the tighter and the smaller you can keep your crew, the better quality of trip you can have. So um, for now, we're keeping group sizes pretty small. Yeah. Okay. And so that's probably one thing. There will be a limited availability as this is, you know, right now people can check this out. Um, you know, we mentioned at the start, the BayIslandExpedition.com. They can check it out. And when they go there, maybe describe that. If they go to BayIslandExpedition.com, as we're speaking, I don't think the, the site is totally fleshed out, but is the idea being they go there and they call you on the phone or they go there and sign up on a form or something like that? How do they, how do they kind of learn more? Yeah, so uh, there is definitely um, going to be something to iron out with the booking because I spend a lot of my summer in the back country. So I'm right. going to make it 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to make it as easy as possible on the website where people can check in on dates, whether it's booked or not. And then um, they can, uh, yeah, I, it, it might sometimes, you know, I'm going to have a little blurb up there is how long it will take me to get back to you. I'm generally, you know, never gone for longer than a week before I, I can reach out to people. But yeah, you know, they'll be able to check whether dates are available or not. And there'll be a lot of, you know, nice, easy information, exactly what we're discussing here. Um, and then uh, I'll have, you know, I got a lot of PDFs and stuff I can send people for pack lists and just what to know a lot because a lot of people have, you know, questions about language barriers and stuff. And so I've got all this information that I can send out to people upon request. And then, of course, the easiest thing always is to just have a phone call, you know, so if folks call me, um, I can just give all the information needed. So, yeah, so that's it. I mean, basically, that's it. You come down. Um, similar to, you know, a lot of the, you know, lodging operations where you come down, you chill out and the next day you're out fishing and then will it be, will you be guiding? Will there be other guides? What does that look like? If you, let's just say you have a, a group of four people, will they be fishing together two on a, a panga sort of thing? Or how does that look? Yeah. You'll generally, um, you know, alternate between, uh, hiking. Uh, if, if a group of four came out, you'd probably like hike one day and then go on the boat the next day, or you could flip flop, you know, hike in the morning. What two hike in the morning to go on the boat in the morning and then swap uh, in the afternoon because we've got a nice amount of flats that you can hike and uh, a lot of flats to hit from the boat. You know, that's uh, yeah, the, the four person trip is you know something that we're kind of entertaining, but for now, you know, the the most effective like you know, fishing trip is definitely just a two person um trip coming down. So, get two people. So, if there was a person person with their significant other or a, a couple of buddies or whatever, basically that's the perfect thing. Come down, talk to you, get some dates that work and then get out there. Is that, is that the best situation? Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, having, you know, done a lot of expedition trips myself here, um, I do a lot of, a lot of me just with two client trips. Um, so it's definitely a lot of folks want to do, you know, the bigger groups, bring four people down, but, um, yeah, there's definitely a, a pretty decent demand for just two people coming at a time. Okay, good. Well, we got some of the logistics there that we can follow up with with you on the logistics, and that all sounds good. Maybe let's jump back into some of the fishing so people know what Honduras has. And this is, is this similar to what you'd be fishing the for in Belize? Yeah, it's standard flats fishing. Um, we've got a lot of really nice flats. Uh, we've got really big populations of bonefish. Um, we see tailing permit pretty regularly um really nice healthy population of permit uh we get tarpon you know you've got a lot of juvenile tarpon in those mangroves throughout the middle of the island and then you'll also um see tarpon coming through come springtime um when they're you know doing their migration so you can see some pretty some pretty good sized tarpon blow-ups and in, in action on the flats which is really fun we get big jacks um and then uh the one fish that we don't see a ton of out there is the snook. All, you know, all the snook that we've seen and, and caught aren't necessarily huge, but yeah, we've got, and then we got a lot of trigger fish. We have a lot of, a lot of hungry trigger fish, which is very exciting. A lot of people come down and cause I brought an, a fair amount of friends fishing down there, you know, up to this point. Um, and everyone's like, I want to get a permit. I want to get a trigger fish. Right. Yeah. Triggerfish would be cool because they have the cool looking mouth with the teeth and all that stuff, right? Yeah, they're they're awesome. They're they're really like a underrated fish. When I see a trigger, I'm always gonna throw a fly at it. Nice, nice. And I'm just thinking, you know, because there are some different places just up north. Here. I'm not sure how far, but you could probably take a boat ride over up to Belize almost, right? It'd be a long one, but you know, it's it's up north. How is your operation, you know, and I, I know it's new. But say compared to some of these other places, like you're going to do things differently. So maybe explain what people can expect at your operation where maybe they wouldn't get in some of these other places around the, the world or the country. Yeah. So um, Utila is such an amazing place with a really beautiful culture and really awesome people. And I want the guests to come and experience Utila. A lot of times you go to a fishing lodge and you won't really ever leave the compound. You stay in this little bubble. You go fishing every day, have a great experience, and I've got nothing against that. I think that's a really great way to do things. Personally, I definitely want people to get out and go explore the island. And so we have a little 
uh, tuk-tuk driver that takes you all over the island anytime that you want. Um, he's, you know, part of the staff here. And uh, he, Danny, will uh, take you, you know, he, he gets you to the boat ramp every day. We take you out to dinner every night. Different restaurants will take you to a really nice little fancy, you know, seafood place with homemade pastas. And the next day we'll take you to um, a, a local fish fry spot where you're eating fresh fish that was caught that day, cooked on a grill. Oh, That's wow. probably like the grill looks like it's like 200 years old. The thing, it just smokes yep. fish like no other. It's awesome. And uh, <laughs> I, it, it's really cool that that little spot there is ran by a, a local gentleman and his daughters are the servers. So it's a family run operation. It's um, it's really unique just to get around and see the island. And it's so small. You run into the same people over and over again. So my clients were here, you know, for seven days. And then, you know, by day five, they're like, everyone knows them on the island pretty much. And they're all they're running into, you know, their friends everywhere they go. So it's just it's a nice, cool, unique experience. People are people want you there. You know, they're excited to have you come visit. So that's what I want folks to experience, you know, go out fish in the daytime the evenings you know we can go out and and see the see the island there's a lot of cool spots to go to yeah that sounds amazing so what are you guys eating do you know the fish that you're eating there at that local restaurant oh yeah man um you got a you got a variety of choices there it's really whatever was caught that day um but a really popular thing to eat down there is barracuda oh barracuda yeah. barracuda is pretty good um i love you know if they got tuna i'll probably go for the tuna snappers good yeah whatever whatever the freshest fish they got is yeah gotcha and are you just looking at at the map this i guess the downtown or the the city part of it is kind of i don't even know what direction that is but are you near the utility actual downtown i see like the mango inn resort things like that yeah so where the uh, ferry dock is there you'll see uh kind of like a three-way road you got the main road that runs along the south shore there and then the road that goes up kind of north into the hills where uh, about like five minutes up that road there. So yeah, it's perfect little location where folks are staying. And then, um, yeah, so you just hop in and and grab a ride to wherever you want to go. You know, we've got a grocery store. A lot of my clients wanted to stop and they really love their spiced rum down there. And it it is the Honduran spiced rum is delicious. And so, yeah, you know, go to the grocery store and get some spiced rum or go and, um, you know, one of my clients wanted to, uh, after dinner, just wanted to wander around, go to like gift shops or go to a bar and, see some music and stuff. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Go enjoy. It's that's what it's there for. Yeah. On the flip side of things, you know, if, uh, if you just want to, if you're tired, I mean, the sun's cooking you while you're fishing and stuff, you're tired. You just want to go grab a bite to eat and then go crash at the place. You can do that too. You know, there's as much or as little for you to explore as you would like. So it's, it's cool. You can get that lodge experience if you want to, where you, you know, just stay at the, at the spot most of the trip when you're not on the water. That's totally fine. I mean, the house is beautiful and gorgeous, and uh, you got a swimming pool and you got balconies. It's a great place to hang out. Um, so you can you can really get the best of both worlds. Yeah, no, I get it. This is this is sound really awesome. I think the the local experience connecting with you know that is definitely a, kind of a more of a unique thing, and and you're able to just kind of check out, right? Cruise around. You're going to get your fishing in, but it doesn't have to be all fishing all the time. It sounds like it could be. What What else are people doing there? You mentioned the backpacking. So people are coming in and what, just hiking up through the mountains and things like that? Uh, no. So people that come to Utila are like when they're visiting are a lot of backpackers that are doing Central America. So a lot of Canadians and Europeans, definitely some Americans, uh, and they're all you know, in their 20s and 30s, and uh, they stop along their way through Central America because they generally are exploring Mexico and Guatemala, Nicaragua, these places, and they'll stop in Utila um, to get their scuba diving certifications. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, it's really, really popular, really popular place to go scuba diving. And that's actually how I found Utila is uh, my girlfriend wanted to get scuba diving certified, uh, you know, I think six plus years ago and uh googled cheapest place to get dive certified and utila popped up and that's uh the yes simple wow. story of how uh, utila got on my radar <laughs> <laughs> gotcha wow and so you yeah so since then you've been working you obviously through fish hound you know expeditions you you're like oh wow this is something you know and who doesn't want to go to some of these you know tropical places 
And so you've been kind of working on that this whole time. How has that been building this thing out? You know, I'm, I'm guessing we've done some trips around, you know, with, with, uh, with fish town with others. And, uh, it's not easy setting these things. I mean, it is, if you have somebody like fish town and you know, you guys, because he sets it all up, but when you're setting up your own operation, you know, which we've done with like Airbnbs and things like that around the country, it's not easy. You know, how's that been for you? Has it been a challenge throughout this whole thing? Has it been, you know, easier than you thought? Oh, dude, it's a cakewalk. Really? <laughs> no, <laughs> it was super challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, super <laughs> challenging, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it wasn't challenging enough to the point where it was like, you know, when obviously so many roadblocks and lots of speed bumps along the way, a lot of fires yeah. to put out and whatnot. But no, at no point was I like, am I not supposed to be doing this? Like, is the, you know, everything really did just keep falling in place. And it took, you know, just enough effort and desire from me, you know, to accomplish it, uh, which is a really good feeling, you know, because I didn't go down to this island with the intention of starting a fly fishing resort. Um, I went down there to go scuba diving and I brought a fly rod to chase a couple bonefish around. And then, you know, one thing I the next we, i'm like man man we we really love this place and so we bought a little piece of land out there and then you know we just keep going back every winter because obviously you know guiding from may to october in alaska you get a little cold so uh we'll go down there when you know winter hits and enjoy some warmth some scuba diving a little fishing and then i you know i'm out there on the flat and we we make a friend you know when adam was visiting and you know he's now like one of my great friends and uh he uh, he's our guide, you know, for uh, his name's Hallard, super fishy dude, born and raised in Utila. He's like, you know, first day we meet, he's like, oh, you guys are fly fishing, man. I've always wanted to be a fly fishing guide. And I was like, oh, cool, dude, I'm, I'm a fly fishing guide. And, you know, <laughs> here we are years later. And now, you know, he's a fly fishing guide. And um, yeah, he's a pretty darn good one at that, too. So, yeah, everything. And, you know, he uh, is the he got the hookup on the resort where everyone stays, you know, that's where we got the lead on that location. So everything, you know, as far as that really did just fall into place very nicely, but definitely was not easy. <laughs> no, not easy. Yeah. And it probably, and there, there probably will be more things along the way, right. That are going to pop up. And how do you deal with that? Like, let's just say you're, well, I guess you're in the off season. So when you're in Alaska, you don't really have to worry about anything, right? You kind of, the lodge is, you know, that that's shut down, right? So it's really when you're there, you have to deal with things. Yeah, there's, you know, plenty of fires to put out. But um, yeah, we didn't have too much really go awry uh, on the first trips out. You know, we definitely, we learned a few things. You know, we were having clients take a ferry over to the island at first and, you know, the, the less things you really have to like work. Cause then you need a, you needed a night stay in Roatan and, and all this. I'm like, let's just charter them a flight. This is way easier. Um, people are coming to spend time in Utila. Roatan is a cruise ship destination. Everybody said like, man, we really don't want to be in Roatan. We just want to come straight here. It was funny cause people land in Roatan and they're like, Oh yeah. Okay. Islands, palm trees, nice. And then they get to Utila and they're like, Oh, this is right. nice. This is yeah. like island life. There's no hustle and bustle here. Like oh, this amazing. is what's want. It is a nice little hidden gem. But yeah, put. I mean, just being a fishing guide, putting out fires and creating solutions, that's the job, man. So it's really nothing too far out of the norm. Oh, right, right. You're already doing that. Well, that was going to be kind of one of my questions as well. So you're up you know, with Fish Town in Alaska doing these remote wilderness. I know, I'm not sure if you still are the remote guy, but you're doing those remote, the fly-in stuff. And then, and then that now you're over here guiding, you know, for different saltwater species. How many of the skills from Fish Hound, you know, transferred over to what you're doing now? Or did you have to learn a lot? And are you still learning a lot about species and everything? Um, yeah, so I'm actually not guiding in Honduras. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so we, we want to give as many jobs as possible to the locals. You know, I'm not going to come down there and uh, essentially steal a guiding job. Also, right. um, you don't really want me to be your guide in Honduras. I wasn't born and raised there. You know, I, All right. you know, I've, I've spent plenty of time there and have chased a lot of those fish, but um, I don't really know everything that there is to know like in alaska like yeah <laughs> right You're gonna be really humble here but y you want me to be your guide in alaska <laughs> but uh in honduras you you want the local dude man uh that's uh and when i go and fish like i 
you know, Hallard's my guide. So, uh, yeah, in Alaska, so the skills transfer has been really unique for me because I'm going from guide to owner, uh, to like managing things. So phone calls, emails, lawyers, paperwork, money, taxes. It's, uh, yeah, being a guide's a lot more fun. That's for sure. Right, right, right. So you're getting used to, so you don't love the, all the business side of it as much, or do you, do you enjoy some of that too? No, I really do like it. And I'm pretty darn good at, I, I, I'm not great at it, but I'm learning a lot and it's cool. And it's what yeah. I've wanted. I wanted to make that transition. Cause you know, I got so many friends, we're all in our thirties now. We've been guiding for, you know, over a decade and it's like, man, my back hurts. My shoulders right. hurt. Like I'm, yeah. I'm getting pretty torn apart. Like being yeah. a backcountry guy <laughs> right. is not easy on your body. Um, you know, Adam is in his early forties now. Uh, he's Adam's the owner of fish hound, great friend of mine. And, uh, he guides, I don't know, maybe three, four backcountry trips a year. Now he definitely t- is taking a step down when we started, when he started fish hound and I started working here like six years ago, um, and he was still in his thirties. He was, you know, absolutely pumping trips out and in the back of yeah. the country, a bunch before he had his daughter and stuff. And there comes a time where like, you got to kind of slow it down and, uh, do a little more email phone call, a little less, uh, back country work on your body. So I'm, I'm getting there, you know, like I still got a couple more years in the tank. That's for sure of, you know, working in the back country, but I'm trying to do what Adam did, which is that slow transition where you just do a few less each summer and a few, a little bit more of the, the booking side of things. That's right. Wow. This is awesome. So, so you're doing it and you now down there in Honduras, you've got this season kind of the winter, you know, our winter, what's it like? Can you fish down there year round as well? Um, I wouldn't recommend it. No. Yeah. I mean, you can, but, uh, really, uh, there's like some months that I do prefer over others. Um, January to, yeah, be about the first, second week of January to the first, second week of April. That's like your prime time slot right there, as is for almost all of the Caribbean uh, saltwater fly fishing operations. And then you can try to go down in November, December. September is actually pretty under. I think September is a decent month and you know you run into a little bit more rain those times of the year uh, but I've been down there a lot in November December just because that's like when I personally want to get the heck out of you know the north and I'm always like man I'll take you know and, and the rain isn't really that bad it's like for an hour sometimes it'll say the in the forecast like yeah it's gonna rain all day and really that just means that it's gonna rain for an hour right and it's not Alaska, right? It's it's not Alaska rain. Yeah, exactly. And it's still, you know, 75 degrees and raining. So, uh, yeah, the, the biggest thing with the weather, and it doesn't matter what time of year you come down, it's just like fishing in Alaska. Like the weather will prohibit you from getting, you know, the best fishing possible sometimes because if it's, you know, really windy, then the boat can't make it out to certain flats. And you're like kind of just working around and and we obviously have places to go when it's windy and we have, you know, a lot of tricks up our sleeve, but you can run into that issue anytime, any month that you book a fishing trip anywhere you go. Yeah, that's right. It's fishing. It is fishing. As far as the best fishing months though, to, for like when the fish are most active, I personally like, uh, I like March. That's a good time. Yeah. March. Okay. So somebody's thinking now, that definitely would be one time that could be good. And in March, are you going to get a chance at all three of the big species, you know, that you mentioned before, but it's except for snook, right? I mean, you all, yeah, there's definitely snook there, you know, but we just don't really get those giants that you see down in like Florida. But uh, yeah, I mean, you'll get an opportunity at all three species, probably really anytime you come down, but you're just going to, it's really more like the quality of the opportunity, if that makes sense. Like, if that fish is tailing and super happy, like, yeah, that's a high quality opportunity. Um, if that fish is just kind of cruising along, eh, opportunity, but a more challenging one. And then if like, you know, you see that fish and by the time you see it, it's coming towards the boat and it's 10 feet away from the boat. And it's like, ah, uh, yeah, we saw it, but like, that's a low, low quality opportunity. 
you're going to have more high quality opportunities in March. And yeah, you'll definitely have opportunities at all three, uh, bonefish tarpon and permit. Yeah. Okay. And what was that down there as far as, you know, do you guys cover all around the Island? Um, where are these flats located? Are they located near, you know, kind of Utila or how far out are you going? Oh yeah. They're all, they're all these flats are touching the Island of Utila for the most part. Um, yeah, they're, they're really, really beautiful flats. You've got the coral reef all along the Island. You know, that's why it's such a scuba diving destination. The Mesoamerican reef comes from Belize down all the way through Utila and the Bay islands, second largest reef in the world. Uh, so the reef is all around the Island and it creates a really nice kind of like cove in the in little harbors along the Island where the reef acts as like a wave break. So you sneak the boat in there. And then you've got this lovely, like there are some pretty big flats, really nice sections to work. And there, a lot of them are like just on the outskirts of the island, you know, anywhere from 15, 20 minute boat ride to like the 40 minute boat ride somewhere in there. Imagine embarking on a journey to Alaska, that ultimate destination for adventure seekers. With Fishhound Expeditions, this dream can become your reality. Picture yourself amidst the wild Alaskan landscape where the northern lights dance across the sky and you're reeling in some of the biggest rainbow trout you've ever seen. It's an experience that feels like a dream, but with Fishhound, it's an adventure waiting to happen. If Alaska is on your bucket list, Fishhound Expeditions is the key to unlocking that dream. Visit fishhoundexpeditions.com today and mention that you discovered them through this podcast. That's F-I-S-H-H-O-U-N-D, Expeditions. Don't just dream about Alaska, experience it with Fishhound. So you mentioned March, but there's a few different good times to go down there. So on that first day out, what are are people chasing? What what are they, is it, do you ask them like, hey, which species do you want to go for first? Or do you have a recommendation? You know, how's that look? So we have a real nice philosophy that uh, if it's a fish, we're going to catch at it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I totally understand people coming down and just like they've done the saltwater thing before and they just want to chase permit. Um, and that's fine. You know, I, I respect that, but to, and, and I'm, I'm the same way, you know, but to that, I would say, okay, we'll just have a permit fly on at all times and a permit leader set up on your rod. And if we see other fish, we're still just going to cast at them with the permit rig. You know, it, it's, you're going to have a crab pattern on a bonefish will eat that. Tarpon, maybe not so much. I'll probably have a tarpon rod rigged up, uh, you know, on the, on the rod vault on the on the boat. But um, yeah, we're definitely just like casting really at any fish. Day one, you know, I'm probably we're probably just gonna go find schools of bonefish, um, you know, and just let some reels sing with those bonefish taken off, and that's good fun. And then you start to get a little little friskier as as you go, you know, start chasing a particular species, but um, I'm definitely not of, I know each client's going to be different and going to want their own things, but me personally, I'm not of the mindset to, to not cast at a fish. Yeah. I'm going to cast a shot. at a fish. <laughs> I don't care yeah, what it that's is. right. That's right. Nice. Yeah. yeah we, we'll yeah. do like some fun trolling as well, you know, from flat to flat. We've got a little trolling rigs and we've caught Spanish mackerel doing that and little, you know, some smaller tunas and needlefish, which we saw a school of mahi. Uh, last time I was out and we were doing the trolling thing and I, I wanted a mahi so bad, but it didn't, it didn't really come together. So, um, yeah, yeah. We just like catching fish. Wow. And what is the trolling? What are you trolling? What's the, the gear set up? Uh, we'll do a little bit of both. I've got a, I've got a spin rod that we'll keep on the boat. And so I can just troll like a squid pattern and it's really fun. Cause I'll, you're holding the rod in your hand as you're trolling. I mean, you're sitting on, on a ponga, which is, you know, kind of a smaller boat and it's on a tiller. So Hallard's, you know, just kind of cruising the boat along as we're going flat to flat. So we're in a little bit of deeper water over top of some deeper reef. And, uh, yeah, so you're just trolling a little top water. And, uh, when that thing, you know, lights up, it's just like, wham, right in your hand, which is, is really, really fun. And then sometimes, uh, we'll actually just troll fly rods too. just start peeling line out of the, out of the reel pretty much right when you get to backing, it's just like, okay, hold on to it. And, uh, yeah, fish will come up and absolutely hammer it. No kidding. Right. Just as you're trolling like a fly, is it kind of just near the surface or just kind of just below the surface? Yeah. It's just creating a little splash, you know, on the surface, looking like a, you know, injured fish. 
And uh, it's just a fun way when you're because the those flats, you know, that I was describing before, you know, they're they're not all lined up right onto each other. Sometimes, you know, you'll fish one and then you've got a 10 minute little boat ride to the next one. And it's like, yeah, might as well have a line in the water. Right on. Do you guys see any um, are there any other fly anglers out or operations in that area? Yeah, there's uh, there's one more um, operation out there and uh, all local guys, you know, they all um, know each other, Hallard and, and those guys. And so um, we uh, kind of stick to our own flats. So um, we never really have, there's never more than one boat on a flat. Okay. Yeah. And your guides are, so how was that finding the guides and getting your guides lined up or, you know, maybe talk about those guys a little bit more, what, what they do and what their expertise is. Oh yeah. So uh, the guy that we got Hallard, he uh, it was a deep sea fisherman. He guided that for for years he's born and raised in utila super fishy dude and right before covid he had always said that he wants to um you know be a fly fishing guide and so yeah he it's really difficult to get things down there you know being there's no amazon going to utila right. uh so he you know met a dude out there that had a fishing setup and he's like yo can i is it easy for you to get, you know, a, a rod and reel and stuff at home? And the guy was like, yeah, I can. And he's like, well, can I buy this one off of you? And you can go get like a new one when you're back home. And the dude's like, uh, yeah, sure. Why not? And so that's how he got his first um, fly rod and reel. And uh, he, yeah, and he was self-taught from there. When I met him, it was really funny because uh, he had, I think his leader was like, and, and, you know, if, if anyone's, you know, experienced in saltwater fly fishing, I generally run like a 12 foot leader. And I think when I met him, his leader was like all of four feet. I'm like, oh, dang, you're definitely new to this. And um, yep. now uh, we're great friends because uh, he's one of those dudes that's very similar to me where it's like we don't really do anything halfway. He is just all in and just constantly researching. And um, he's made some good friends with uh, the dudes over in Guanaja. Um, I don't know if you guys know Flyfish Guanaja. Oh, pretty yeah, popular yeah. spot um yep steve's a steve's a friend uh steve brown who runs that and so sent uh hallard over there and um got him acquainted with those guys and so he's just always wanting to learn and uh just is so into it absolutely loves doing it which is is really fun to watch always trying to learn new things new tricks so he's he's the dude that you want you know in my opinion like when i'm when i'm guiding like you can definitely see some folks that start to, you know, just kind of, they're just turning the wheels and it's, you know, just another day. This is their job. This is their life. I really like having someone that is kind of younger and fresher to it. Um, that's like, dude, we're going to catch this fish. We are going to do everything in our, you know, we're just going to do everything that we can to catch this fish. Whereas, you know, some of the older dudes, it's going to be like, ah, we tried, you know, right. let's, uh, you know, not that, that's not yeah, happening yeah. today. And I mean, it, it, I get that. It's fine. That definitely happens. But uh, that's the type of guide I am. It's like, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to catch that damn fish. That's it. And what does it look when you're out there? So bonefish, I'm guessing that there's more opportunities at bonefish. Like on, on uh, permit, what's what's that look like? Are there how many, you know, you're getting some shots? Like, what does that look like? And I'm guessing tarpon is another one where you maybe, if they're not there, there maybe won't be. In, or how's, describe just the, the kind of the numbers and what you somebody could expect out there. Yeah, so we've got really big schools of bonefish that, you know, you can find in a lot of different places. So, yeah, the school, schools of bonefish are pretty big. The size of the bonefish uh, is always kind of funny because like you know you have this fish that just absolutely rips line to the backing i mean i think bonefish are the sixth fastest fish on the planet right. um, and then you you know you finally get this fish in and you're expecting a two foot to three foot fish and you're like oh damn this is a you know right 18 inch bonefish you know which is all like this you know standard they're just they're really fun fish to catch and so yeah we've got some pretty big schools of them that are that are really fun to throw flies at permit i mean i've seen some really you know the, so the permit when they're younger um they're gonna school up together uh and i've seen some really big schools of permit just kind of cruising along through there uh, once they start to get a little larger you're gonna find uh two or three of them together hopefully tailing and we definitely you know we find tailing permit um it's just you know it's the early morning 
um, situation. You're hopefully going to get some shots at permit tailing when you first get out there on the flat. And then once the day goes on, you know, it's a little hotter. A lot of the fish will go to the deep. They'll get off the flat and go deep. So that morning window is definitely when you're going to see the tailing permit. And it def- it happens, man. I mean, I think my last clients said that they saw a tailing at least one tailing permit every day that they were out and fished for five days. So that's really cool. That's a high quality shot. You know, that is a fish that is happy. It is feeding, you know, permit are absolute bastards when it comes to, you know, sniffing that fly and rejecting it or getting spooked. You know, um, I had one where I, I pretty much, I hit his tail with, the fly i had multiple shots and he just he was so happy with his whatever he was chewing on down there and uh i just like you know my fly just couldn't get into his zone so i just hit him with it and he kind of spooked and then came back around and still kept eating right there i'm like this is crazy this fish is huh. just begging to be caught. and uh the tarpon are that's interesting. That time of year, some of those tarpon will like kind of partner up almost and they'll sit perfectly still down the flat and they like they just won't even move. And you could get the boat like two feet from them sometimes and they're just going to chill there and they're not even going to glance at your fly. So that can be frustrating. I'm not really sure what's going on with that. I think it's something to do with mating or whatever, or maybe they're resting because they're migrating. But the tarpon, when you see them on the flat, they're going to be blowing up on mullet, smaller bait fish. And uh, yeah, you just chuck that fly in front of them and strip hard. And for the love of God, don't trout set. Right. Are these my, so these are big, uh, <laughs> large tarpon? Yeah. Uh, I got some pictures I can send you some nice tarpon that we got on the last trip. You know, we're not going to be hitting those 200 pounders, that's for sure. But uh, a nice tarpon is like 40 pounds. Yeah, 40 pounds. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice tarpon. Okay. So you got the tarpon, and then you mentioned there's some snook out there, a little smaller, and then, but those are the still the, the species you guys are focusing on. And then I guess adding trigger fish into the mix, right? Yes, sir. Yep. So you got your, you know, your big, uh, your big flat fish uh, that you, you know, chase around the majority of the Caribbean. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's kind of take it out of here. We're going to do wrap things up a little bit. This is kind of our, um, our shout out segment. And, uh, and we have, we have our own travel program, which is why this works really great because we have people that are focused on, you know, where can they go next? And we're trying to paint the picture of these different places that are pretty unique. And it sounds like, you know, Honduras is one of those places that although there's operations up and around the area, you know, there's not as many as say, if you were to probably go up to Belize or right, or some of these other areas, but, um, but the shout out today is to Robert Gentry. He's one of our, uh, podcast pro members. And I want to give a shout out to Robert because, you know, our idea being is that we're putting this group together to help people travel. And and today's is presented, we mentioned it before, but by Fishhound Expeditions. And uh, and maybe just give it a let, let's start off with this final little segment here with Fishhound. Talk about just briefly, you've got this season coming up. How does that feel where you are right now? It's like April, May, you know, you're right around the corner, right, to Alaska. Are you going to be going in the backcountry full on this season? What's that look like? Yeah, man, feels good. It's uh spring's the best i'm gonna go chase some steelhead with, with the boys in like two or three weeks here in the beginning of may down in the southeast alaska so adam and will and you know all of our uh all of our mangy crew of guides that we got here we're gonna go be monsters <laughs> and chase some steelhead and um then the season will start you know may is pretty pretty slow and chill i really i really like may because uh it's like you always got a code to crack uh, you know, the fish are kind of picky. And then once June hits, like it was nice knowing you boys, I'm out of here and, uh, yeah. I'll just kind of sp- spend the rest of my life in the back country until October when we start chasing steelhead again. And then, uh, yeah, then November's here before you know it, it's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. That's it. You're, you're going, I mean, you, does it feel like, I mean, you've got these two places now. Do you feel like long-term, you know, um, that the, you know, kind of the Central America thing could be a, a full-time thing? Or is this more like you're always going to have the, you know, the mainland back to Alaska or wherever? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I live in Alaska for a reason. I love the vastness. I love just hopping in, in the car and I can go to Homer. You can get down to Homer, which is like a, you know, seven-hour drive from Telkeetna where I live and you only make one turn 
you know <laughs> right yeah I, I i love alaska so you know honduras is amazing place i absolutely love it down there but at a certain point you know 16 square miles i definitely am ready to get back to my mountains and some snow yeah that's uh, good. but uh yeah, Alaskan summers are unbelievable. They're amazing. So, uh, yeah, you, you can't, the fishing's great. So, I definitely enjoy it. My Alaska summers, my Honduran winters. Yeah. So, you're staying. So, Alaska is your place. You're not planning on leaving Alaska anytime soon. You're loving the, I mean, the nice thing is, is that you're not experiencing the winters in Alaska right now. You're, you're, you're out of there. Yeah. I split it up this year. I did uh, November and December in Honduras. And then I did January and February in Alaska. Alaska. And then I did March in Honduras. So it was nice. I still had two months of winter here. So uh, yeah, rather than just kind of doing one big long. So I, st I still do enjoy a little bit of winter. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We got down to negative 40. I was gonna say so negative 40. <laughs> negative 40 for a straight week here in Telkeetna. Wow. It was brutal. That was a little that was a little much. That was in January, I think. But uh um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not too shabby right now. I mean, it's April sun's going down at like 10 PM. Um, it's been like, you know, mid fifties during the day with some sunshine, like the, the rivers are about to be fishable here very soon. Um, uh, I'm getting stoked, man. This is really cool. Okay. So, so this is clear. You've, you've got the best of both worlds going now. Um, with your operation, but let's take it. Let's keep in this um, outro segment here. So I've got a few kind of uh, tips, questions, and a few random ones. But maybe let's just talk. Um, you know, somebody's getting ready to do this trip with you. Maybe they want to do Honduras. They want to meet up and do this amazing local. You know, kind of what feels like kind of local village, kind of local area. Um, what is a tip you're telling that person to get ready for this trip? Like when they're on the flats to catch, you know, a permit or any of the other species. Do you have a couple of, of big saltwater tips for us? Oh, yeah, definitely. So think like the bait. Think like the fly. Uh, if you're fishing a crab or a shrimp, they're going to act differently. Um, so you need to really be aware of the fly that you are using. When you're stripping flies for trout, you're just like, oh, it's just something swimming in the water. And you don't really put a lot of like conscious, you know, awareness into how you're stripping and what that fly is doing. You're just kind of putting it in the river and the water, you know, the river kind of manipulates the fly a certain way and gives it action. Whereas this there's you're not in a river. You're essentially in, you know, you're in the ocean, you're in a big, huge pond with a little bit of waves and some action. These flies, these crabs, they're never going to go to the surface. That's unsafe for them. So if you do a fast strip, that's going to rise. That's going to bring the fly up in the water column. And that does not look real. And that fish will immediately reject it. What the crab's going to do is it's going to, and, and a lot of times the shrimp as well, is they're, if they're getting chased or they sense danger, they're going to burrow down. They're going to go down into the turtle grass. So if that permit is on it and looking at it, don't strip it. Let it be because then it's going to fall down. And that's what the permit's doing when it's tailing is its face is in the turtle grass, in the sand, and pulling that fly up off of the bottom where the, where the crab feels safe. And that's when you, yeah, that's when you give them the whammy. Don't trout set, strip set. Uh, but that's definitely the thing that's helped me the most um, and helped a lot of the, the clients, a lot of people that have come down here is really, you know, and I'll go on, I'll pull up YouTube videos and show people how shrimp swim, how crabs swim. And it, and it is very helpful. Yeah. That's some, that's awesome. Awesome tip. What does it give us a fly? I think you mentioned this before, but what, what's one pattern you love out there if you had to throw it on for permit and bonefish? The cheeseburger. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. It's a sweet looking fly. I got a picture of one posted on my Instagram, uh, just the other day, which is uh Bay Island expeditions yeah. on Instagram. Um, and it's it's a crab pattern with like a little squirmy tail coming out of it. It it just looks like everything. It, it kind of looks like a like a, a shrimpy crab or like so we just call it the cheeseburger because it's it's everything all in one. The cheeseburger is great. And then, you know, bonefish, they can't resist like a Peterson spawning shrimp or a um, bone bitter bitter. Yeah, uh -huh. bone bitter is a really nice. Fly. I think Orvis makes that one. OK, um, I like that one a lot because it's very lightweight. And a lot of times these bones that you're going to be chasing are in two feet of water. So when that fly lands, you want it to be like 
the smallest little drop in a bucket. You don't want it to make a big old splash. So I like the bone bitters because um, they uh, just land very softly. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm, and I'm on your uh, Bay Island Expeditions. I guess give us the um, the handle. It's Is it Bay underscore Island underscore Expeditions? Yep. Yep, it is. That's it. it. I'm looking at it now. Yeah, I got you. Okay, just want to make. Yeah, you got some nice. You got some swag going. You've you've got it all, and you got some photos of the uh, the lodge here. Wow, this is really cool. Now I'm seeing it, and you got somebody's on a motorcycle, uh, cruise around. Okay, so we'll put some links to some of these photos, and we'll use this. This is really amazing. I see the view from the from the lodge. It's epic. Yeah, like, man. There's a swimming pool, back deck, and you're looking out at the like the forest, then down to the water. This is really cool. There it is, man. How did that place come together? Because that looks like just like the perfect spot. So we've got uh, Hallard, who's the homie, man. It, you, you just you just got to know someone that was born and raised there. And uh, so his uh, long-term girlfriend used to be the vice mayor of Utila. And she now runs a travel agency out of Utila. So it's like one of those things like, man, this all really came together well. Like now we got someone that can easily charter us flights from Roatan and whatnot. And so um, she's got the uh, fantastic connection on this house. Gotcha. Wow, this is cool. And so no, this is, it looks like you did a good job with all your picks. I'm seeing now all the species, tarpon. Yeah, you got it all on here. So you should have, what is this one? I'm going to take a look at this one. You got, um, oh, is that a shark? You got a, uh, yeah, nurse shark. Yeah, we caught a nurse shark. I forgot about that. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. That's uh that's pretty odd. We we just did I've been mentioned this. We just did an episode with uh, uh on Mako sharks. Uh, oh, you know, cool. And, Heck uh, yeah. And it was like, wow. It was intense. But uh but yeah, there's sharks. I mean, there's lots of sharks that will will be out there that will bite your stuff, right? Or do you guys or is that is that like a one-time thing? I've cast at them a lot. That's the first time I've seen them eat it. But uh yeah, we, we see you see a lot of ac action on the flats. I mean, you got eagle rays cruising through. You got a lot of nurse sharks, like box fish, stingrays. You know, uh, it's the flats are one of the coolest ecosystems ever. Um, there's never a dull day out there. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's give us uh, as we take it out of here. I we've been doing a beginner series in fly fishing, trying to again. We're, we're up to a 600 episode, over 600 episodes now, and we're we're trying to celebrate. You know, maybe new people coming into it. And so, when you look back at your beginner self, you know, I'm not sure how long ago that was, but what would be the advice or the tip you'd give your yourself back when you first started in fly fishing? Hmm, probably hire a guide. There you go. Because <laughs> I taught myself <laughs> terrible, terrible habits, and it was more difficult for me to unlearn those habits and fish properly than if I had just learned the proper way to start, you know, like, uh, you know, a lot of wrist, I did a lot of wrist breaking, which so many people do in, you know, that are dry fly anglers. They, you know, cause you can just, you can bend the rod and get the fly where it needs to go with breaking your wrist. And you come out to Honduras and we're going to put a nine weight in your hands with some heavy grain, like shooting head on it and a really long leader. And you're going to break your wrist and it's not, and you're going to be shooting into the wind. It's just not going to go anywhere, you know? So take that, uh, take that butt of the rod and duct tape it to your forearm. And, and, uh, but yeah, you know, in all that guide, will help you with hopefully if they're a good guy they'll they, you know i actually had a, i had a dude last year who just bought a fly rod in like for birthday or something his dad got him a guided trip with me and um so we spent i, I think we caught like two fish but all day we spent the entire day casting you know going over everything i put dry flies on him for him i put a bobber on for him i put a streamer on taught him the three different you know ways to present those different uh, flies and taught them, you know, roll cast, chuck and duck, um, overhand, like everything. And so like, yeah, if you hire a guy to be like, yeah, I'd love to catch a fish, but really I want to learn how to fish. They, you know, should do that for you. Yeah. I'm thinking down for Bay Island, you know, expeditions that a lot of the people will have some, a lot of experience probably with just, you know, fly fishing in general, but, but with Alaska, I know you, with what you guys have, I think you do get some new people to it. What does that look like when you have somebody new who maybe isn't that good at casting or, or maybe hasn't cast at all? Do you ever see that at all on your trips? Oh, yeah, man. That's the life of a fly fishing guide. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, if you're like a really stout angler, 
you know, and, and you really know what you're doing, like those folks don't really get guides a whole lot. They're going to do a DIY trip. If you're kind of more of the weekend warrior or you're, re- you know, like you've a lot of people have their home water dialed in, you know, they've got their spots and they know what flies to use and they are good enough, you know, for those locations and they love fly fishing. But then when they come to Alaska, it's a whole different ball game and they are, you know, definitely challenged by shooting heavier flies doing the roll cast but to that man like it's totally fine come up here if you're a terrible fisherman we're gonna catch fish we're gonna have fun um because i'm rowing the boat i'm gonna show you all the tricks and just like in same thing you know in honduras that's the that's the reason you hire a guide we're gonna show you how to double haul how to side cast and kind of fight that wind you know that's that's why you hire a guide because it's essentially you admitting that you like i don't know the spot i don't know the place i don't really know the fish I want to bring a dude that does. Thanks for giving me a job. Shout out to everyone that has ever hired a guide. <laughs> I've hired guides, you know. <laughs> That's right. No, I think that is. We've been doing this in. I've heard you know get a guide has been a big tip by a lot of you know people who have been on the podcast. So it's a great one. I think it's probably one of the most recommended things, and it makes a lot of sense. So I'm glad you you said that. Um, Let's just go down the road. I we've had uh, we've had a couple of listeners in recent recently uh, talk about our vices question, which we used to have on. I can't remember if I asked you this on the last one, but let's just take it away with this one, and then we'll head out of here. So the vices is you know first of all, do you do much tying, fly tying? Not a ton, no. Just enough to get some woolly buggers and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. So we won't we'll worry about the that side of the vices. Um, the type of ice you use, but more on the vices of what you do. You know, this is the question of what, what do you do? Maybe some things that you've done in your past, you've had to give up or maybe something you're doing now that's maybe not the best thing for you. And you're thinking, and I always go back to mine is the tobacco, right? I was, oh, I, I kind of Rollies. had that thing for many years and yeah, yeah, totally. So what's your, what's your vice? Give us a vice, something that, you know, you you're partaking in or in the past that you had to give up. Oh man, the Rollies. I love, I love being in the back country and rolling rolling up an american spirit yeah i love a good i love a dart in the back country and it, it's brutal because i i don't do it in the winter so i i i you know smoke my rollies all summer long when i'm in the back country and then every fall i get to go through the whole quitting yep yeah not doing it and then <laughs> Come the springtime and I get in the back country and I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm going to start again. (laughs) It's like an idiot. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) So you quit in the winter. Why why do you quit in the winter? You just, you know, Alaskan, you can't be a full time uh, back country guide. You know what you would you gotta you gotta leave the guiding stuff out there on the river. You can't really bring it home. You know, it's just it's a different world out there. I mean, I'm. I'm pooping in in a ground in a hole in the ground every day. Like you just like there's certain things in the back country that you just can't really bring home. And so I don't bring home the rollies. I don't bring home too much whiskey or any of that. You know, that's that's a summertime around the campfire thing. And then wintertime comes around. It's like, OK, I've got to be, you know, a domesticated cam. Gotcha. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. So you got. So you got something there still. That's a great vice, by the way. That's something that you're you're hanging on to. So we'll. I was probably was I was I smoking the rollies when when we were on our trip together. I'm trying to think. I don't remember if we ha- if you did. I feel like maybe you did, but I don't even remember. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago now. That was yeah yeah. Well, I think we're doing another short one. Um, you know, maybe next year with uh, maybe like a. Uh, I think we're gonna do something like a day trip or you know something closer to home. Maybe well, shit, I mean the biggest fish I got on that trip was when I did that, that first day with Will, we went down, what's that stream lo- that right locally? That's that killer stream we could drive to legendary Willow Creek. Yeah. Willow, Willow. Yeah. Willow. I mean, that was, so I think we're going to do maybe a, a, an event giveaway around Willow Creek and get somebody a, a trip there is what we're thinking. But, um, but yeah, man, this is, yeah, um, man. yeah, it's good. It's all good. I think you got, you got the best of both worlds. It sounds like. Yeah. I can't complain, man. I'm really stoked. I'm really, really excited to show people, um, Utila, I want to bring, you know, folks down fishing. It's such a cool place. And, you know, I want to uh, bring some, you know, some business, some jobs to the people that island. So, uh, yeah, it, it's been really, really fun. It's been a huge learning experience. And um, thank you so much for, you know, having me and let me uh, talk about it, you know, because I've just been dying to talk about this. This has been my whole life for the last, you know, three years is plus is getting this company up and running so um it's just it. it's surreal it's crazy love it no it's good cam to be here with you on this and we'll send everybody out to bayislandexpedition.com 
and, uh, and they can check in with you, see what sort of availability you have. And yeah, I'm excited too. I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, down the line, I'll be able to get down there with you and experience that. I think there's, you know, so many great places. But the cool thing about what you explained today is you have this really cool, unique um, in-touch trip to the local area, right? And it's, it's not this giant operation. I think that's the, what sets you apart, right? I think that's one of the cool things. Yeah, I like it, keeping it small, keeping it, you know, just more exclusive like that. And uh, yeah, it's got a real nice like family touch to it. It's really great. Perfect. All right, Cam, we'll, uh, we'll uh, send everybody out there. And yeah, until we uh, talk again, uh, thanks for all your time and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Dave, and great chatting with you. Hope to see you soon. All right. Are you in for Honduras? Cam will likely have limited spots. So if you want to find out, you can check in with him this month and see what he has available for later in the year. And like we talked, he's going to be out traveling around Alaska. So you have to try to catch him while he's free. But check out the website. That's the best place. If you get a chance, please follow this show. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you can do that really quick. Click that little plus button. You'll follow the show and you'll get updated when that next episode goes live. And right now, I have no idea what we're heading on to next. But you know it's going to be an interesting one with a great guest. We're in the process of getting out Wet Fly Swing Podcast Pro. And if you're interested in finding more, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash pro. And you can enter your name and email and we'll follow up with you with availability there on our program, which is being updated and launched. This is our chance to help you travel to some of these destinations to get the resources and just go deeper with the podcast in the community. Uh, if you're interested in connecting with people around this country, around the world, and have a community that supports you and will allow you to put together some of these amazing trips, check out Wet Fly Swing Podcast Pro right now, and you can find out more. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to head off to the next one. So thanks for stopping in and checking in with Cam, Fishhound, and the team. I'm excited to check in. Hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.